this was back in 2013 when I was living in New York City as a 23 year old. I was living with my best friend from college on the west side near Times Square in K-Town. I was going through some tough times back then as I was unemployed at the time. I had a lot of time so I would go on walks by myself to clear my head from time to time and one night I was feeling especially depressed so I decided to walk to K-Town to grab a drink for myself. I'm Korean by the way. I walked into a Korean bar and I got some weird looks from the waiter as I asked for a table by myself. After ordering a couple of soju bottles, I was feeling pretty drunk so I decided to walk back home. However, as I was exiting out of the bar, this Korean guy followed me. He looked pretty normal, just like a typical nice Korean guy that might uh, frequent that area. He told me that he saw me drinking at the bar by myself and that he would love to walk me home to make sure I get home safe. I politely declined, after all my apartment was pretty close, but he insisted and he looked so harmless that I decided to take him up on his offer. We walked like 10 minutes I think and it was quite pleasant. We were both a little drunk but I remember talking about all sorts of things, nothing really personal. When we finally arrived at my apartment I thanked him and wished him farewell. No, my apartment was a five-story walk-up, and there was a main door where we needed a key to open it to get into the building, as there was no doorman. I didn't think much of it, and inserted the key to open the door and went in. The door takes a while to close shut, and it was my mistake for not checking before I went up the stairs. While I was approaching the second floor, I heard someone grab the door from closing, and I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. I literally got goosebumps all over my body and I immediately felt like I was in danger. As I started to pick up the pace, I heard the footsteps going faster up the stairs. I lived on the fifth floor and I started to run up, clutching my keys in my hand. The guy started to run up the stairs as well and I can literally hear him getting closer and closer to me. This all happened in a couple of seconds, but it felt incredibly long. I finally get to the floor and as I tried to open the door, I looked back and literally saw the guy's head on the staircase. I rushed to open the door and I managed to close the door right on his face. My heart was beating so fast and I didn't know what to do at that point. It was already 3am and my roommate was asleep. Luckily he didn't knock or anything so I decided to just go to my room and hope that he was gone. Around 7am my roommate woke me up. She said that there was a man standing in front of our apartment door. My heart instantly sank, and I explained the whole situation to her. She and I went to the door and screamed that we were going to call the police if he doesn't go home. I looked through the peephole, and he told me that he'll only go home if I gave him my number. We then called the police and saw him being escorted out. My roommate had to go to work, so she left the apartment and called me a few minutes later. She told me that she saw the guy speaking to the police downstairs, and apparently... He tried to lie to the officers that I was his girlfriend and that we got into a fight. My roommate went up to them and explained to the officers that I do not have a boyfriend and that she doesn't know him at all. The police let him off with a warning. About two hours later I heard a buzz from the main door downstairs. Maybe it's the police I thought. Surely it can't be him again. I answered the intercom and I was shook. It was him again. Just give me your number and I'll go away, he said. I warned him that I'm going to call the police again if he didn't leave. A couple of minutes later, I heard ferocious knocks on my door. He must have gotten in when someone was entering the building, and I was terrified at that point so I immediately called the police. Unfortunately, the guy ran away before they got there. And the worst part about this experience was that my roommate and I were so scared to leave and come back to our apartment I would have anxiety every time I come home, worried that I might see him in front of our apartment door. For about a week, the police escorted us up when we felt scared, and God bless them for it. I never saw him again, but it was one of the scariest moments of my life. I'm going to start this story off by saying that at the time this happened, I was a 19 year old sophomore in college. I was living on campus in their apartment style dorms and my college wasn't exactly in the nicest part of the city, so I'd usually drive a little bit further to go to grocery shopping so 
I could be in a little bit more of a safer area. The night this happened, I was going to cook dinner and realized I didn't have some of the spices I needed. Normally I wouldn't just say, forget it, and maybe something else, but the meat had already been thawed for a day or so and I needed to cook it. I debated just going to Walmart that was about two minutes away from my campus, but it was getting late and I didn't want to go there by myself in the dark. That Walmart is right next to a major highway and being a girl, by yourself, I felt uncomfortable risking it. So instead, I went to the Walmart that was about 20 minutes away and a few towns over. I got to that other Walmart and bought my spices along with a few other things and checked out, no problem. By the time I was done, it was now completely dark out. I was back at the driver's side of my car and putting my few bags in the passenger seat when I noticed a woman, she was African American, maybe in her 50s, looking in the back of my car. At the time, I drove a really old car and if you knew your cars, it would be surprising that it was still running. I've had a few people in the past, older men usually, look at or come up and ask me about my car. I figured that this is what that lady was doing and I kind of ignored it until, out of the corner of my eye, I saw her come around my car and stop about two feet behind me where I was standing. I was parked next to a parking lot median so it's not like she was getting in a car next to me. Excuse me. She said. I turned around saying, Yes? Kind of prepared to answer, Hey, what year or model is your car? My church has given out leftover boxes of food from our food drive to people in need. Can I give you one? We have them out in our car over there. This immediately set off an alarm in my head. I mean, she had just seen me put my groceries in my car. Why would I need something else if I just went shopping? Also, the churches and food pantries around my college were usually cleaned out after they had their shopping days for the people who really relied on things like food drives. There was hardly, if ever, anything that was just left over. I had watched enough Criminal Minds and read enough Facebook posts to note that this felt like a human trafficking lure. I stuttered over my words a bit at first, trying to figure out what to say, but finally got out, Oh, uh, no thank you, I'm good. I'd like to see it go to someone who really could use it. I felt like that was an okay response if she really was handing out boxes. Are you sure? They're just right over here in my car. She said, taking a step and making the gap between us a little smaller. I was panicking. As she stepped closer, I tried to nonchalantly put my hand in my bag and look for the small pocket knife my dad had given me. My mind was racing as I tried to find the knife but also try to keep my face looking calm and not suspicious. I repeated to her that I was good and that the box of food should go to someone who could really use it. She finally seemed to let up, saying, Okay, have a good night. God bless you. And all that. I told her to have a good night as well, then as soon as her back was turned, I got into my car and locked all the doors. As I pulled out of my parking spot, I noticed that the car she was walking to had three large men standing at the trunk of the car. They were barely illuminated by the parking lot lights, but I think it was an early 2000s white Nissan. As I tried to go down the parking lot aisle as fast as I could, I saw the men looking at the back of my car, just like the woman had. I then noticed where their eyes were shifted to. They weren't looking at my car, they were looking at my license plate. Just as I got to the end of the aisle, waiting to turn, I saw two of the men get in the front seats and the other man and the woman get in the back seat. The car started and they started to pull out too. I was having a full-blown panic attack now. Just a week before, my friend had posted something on Facebook about how two men followed her and her mom through a Walmart. Again, I had watched enough crime shows to know that this wasn't painting a pretty picture. I finally got my opportunity to turn, but that car was coming up behind me. I made the quick decision to take a really odd way back to campus. I made a ton of turns and went through a lot of small streets instead of taking one of the two main roads. I don't think I saw the car again after I pulled out of the parking lot, but I was definitely not risking it. By the time I got back to my college, I had calmed down a little. I started to wonder, maybe you're overthinking this. Believe there actually are good people in the world and I decided that if they really were giving out boxes of food, then hopefully it does go to someone in need. 
that was until I was walking behind my car, heading towards my building. There was a SF faintly written in white sidewalk chalk on the brown paint of my car. I was shocked and terrified, knowing that I definitely did not put that there. I said out loud, oh my god, as I practically dropped my bags on the ground and rushed to wipe the chalk off with the sleeve of my jacket. My car had been tagged. After a few seconds of wiping, the chalk was gone, so I locked my car, grabbed my bags, and raced into my building. I got in my dorm and saw the dinner I was supposed to make, but I had lost my appetite completely. I put everything away and went into my bedroom, still reeling over what had happened in the last 45 minutes. I sent the whole story as a Snapchat video to some of my friends who were all just as shocked as I was. My one friend, Sarah, said that she thinks SF stood for single female. It made sense, which made the whole experience that much scarier. I called my mom afterward and told her everything that happened. By the end of the call, she was sending me an Amazon package with pepper spray in it. I didn't go out after dark or by myself for about two weeks after that happened. I'd have a friend from campus or work go with me or I just wouldn't go at all. The whole situation was terrifying, but I think the strangest part about all of it was that I was supposed to have been in the safer area. I drove all the way to that Walmart because I had a bad feeling about the one that was closest to me. I started going to the Walmart that was closer to me after that and I never had a negative experience at the closer one since I started going. It's hard to believe that all that stuff I've seen on TV and the internet could have almost happened to me. It was a cold October night at around 11 p.m. when me and my buddy were cruising and stopped to take a smoke break. We got out of the car in a secluded area in a small village called Morsel. The place we walked was next to a dark, running biking track which entered a forest. We sat down on the bench outside the tree line smoking our special cigarettes under the subtle light of the moon. A remarkable thing about this spot was that it was located in view, within 50 meters, of the Horror House of Morsel. In 1996, three people were brutally murdered in there, and it has since been sealed up. It is known that the interior is untouched since those of that crime. A documentary was made about this, and that's how I know this info. And here's the other thing I know. The two murderers are already released from jail, and by the time of my incident, one was let go from prison just months before. Back to the bench... After 10 to 15 minutes, our eyes were able to see better in the dark, and I started looking towards the dark path running in the forest. Between the trees, I saw something which I thought was a bag or a mask on a rope hanging from a branch at eye height. Immediately, I told my friend, and he agreed about that conclusion. But after moving a few steps closer and focusing our eyesight, we saw it was a grown man with a bag or mask on his head in the dark. He was standing in some bushes and we saw the movement of his breathing and that he was wearing regular boomer clothes. First, we quietly told each other and said WTF and confirmed we both saw exactly the same thing. Reminder that this person was standing like 10 meters away from us and this is for 10 to 15 minutes in pitch black darkness. Then we were looking at him for another minute until I started yelling at him. I just yelled things like, Hey, come out. I did this despite being spooked by the strange experience. It's just how I am, I guess. He then raised his hand in the motion of aiming a gun and we ran back to the car as fast as we could. Looking behind my shoulder, we saw that he was keeping his arm aimed at us, but we couldn't make out if he actually had a gun. After getting out of there and composing ourselves, we did realize one more very disturbing thing. The guy did not want to mess with two adult young males. In the daylight, a lot of people traverse this place by bike or on foot. So, one of the possibilities is that this crazy man was going to intercept a lone person in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is the first time posting here and this event happened in 2018. I work at a SeaTac airport, which I still think is probably the smallest international airport I have ever seen. 
The airport was so small that your workstation almost forces you to work alongside with other jobs. In this case, I work in sales and we were stationed next to the wheelchair lane, which usually had one wheelchair pusher in the lane. Now, keep in mind, I was only 19 when this incident happened. I would say I'm a sweet person who goes out of my way to start conversations with people that looked bored since I worked night shifts at the airport. There were practically nobody flying and there would be more workers than passengers. Therefore, we meet Mike, who's around the age of 20 to 23. Mike was one of the wheelchair pushers who looked completely out of it, zoned out and didn't seem very talkative. Me and Mike worked side by side in lanes. He would usually come to give the person in the wheelchair lane a lunch break and then proceed to go back to pushing people in wheelchairs throughout the airport. The 30 minutes we saw each other every day was completely awkward and quiet, until one day he overheard me and my co-worker's conversation about depression. He propped up in his chair and goes, Yeah, I agree with you, depression sucks. And that's when I realized, oh man, this kid doesn't just look depressed, but he probably is. No, I didn't know how that small interaction changed our perspective on Mike. He would join our conversation and even went out of his way to say hello and give us a little hug while he finds us throughout the airport. One day, my lead suggested me and Mike should go out for tacos since we both kept complaining about how nothing opens late at night and we were always hungry. Now, we've known Mike for almost a month now and his depression-filled body started filling with joy every time we would find out that we were stationed next to each other. At this rate, we laughed it off saying no way. It would be too weird if we went alone together. I was currently single and was no way attracted or interested in Mike like that. He then looked at me saying, I actually know this amazing rent Mexican spot that's nearby if you're actually really hungry. They serve the best fish tacos. Not knowing the fat idiot that I was, I didn't decline. I loved eating late at night and Mike never gave me stranger danger vibes, I guess. I agree because I don't see the harm going out to get tacos before I sleep. We exchanged our numbers and I headed home before him since I clocked out about an hour before he does. Now when I arrived home I was getting dressed to go out to eat and the plan was to just meet up at the spot since the Mexican spot ended up being only about 5 minutes away from my house. I get a text from Mike saying he wants to pick me up. I kept refusing because I just finally got my driver's license and the place was only 5 minutes away from my home. After almost 40 minutes of us insisting how we were going to get there I finally gave in to have him pick me up which I would later regret. Now I was a big girl, like we're in the 200 zone compared to Mike, who was very thin and short so I wasn't worried if he attempted anything with me. I told him to pick me up along a street down the road because I didn't really want him to know where I exactly lived just yet. And his beat up trash Toyota pulls up and we head to the Mexican spot. We got our food and it was amazing that we went for seconds and we had a good talk watching the soap opera that was on television. After we were done, we get back into his car where he was supposed to drop me back at home, but he stops. He looks at me and says, Can we talk in private? I know a spot. I kindly refused and told him it's already 2am and we should probably get back home and he says, I know it's late, but I just have a lot going on in my life and you're the only person that's really hung out with me like this. And the kind of idiot that I am, I said sure. Already seeing him driving down the road, I noticed so many red flags as the street lights start disappearing, the more his mood and tone starts to change. A complete change in atmosphere starts to emerge around Mike. He starts telling me, I sure do hate the society about women nowadays. They all have this stupid standard. I hate them. I hate them. And I'm like, did I just find a woman hater? Mike never rubbed me off as being that way. He's just starting to seem every time he attempts to talk to a woman, they blatantly reject him. And me, being a woman, is now this dummy that he's projecting all his female hate talk towards. I was actually too stunned to speak because he became a whole different person during the drive. We arrive at an abandoned skate park in the middle of God knows where, and he tells me to get out. I listened and 
here we are at 2 a.m. sitting on a cold concrete floor in freezing temperatures. He goes on and tells me how he hates women and how he would lie to his passengers he takes in his wheelchairs and tell them that he's from the UK and speaks in a British accent. And I was just so overwhelmed. Like, what in God's name is happening right now? He then talks to me in a British accent from there on how he would give his life up for God and God was the only one keeping him chained down. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, God would want me to castrate myself since he doesn't want me touching or being near a female creature for my own safety. I was completely quiet the whole time, confused, questioning myself how much of a fool I was to even think that I thought this guy liked me, and I was completely wrong. After 30 minutes, I was getting cold since this female creature that I was was anemic. I told him I would like to go home now, and he says, no, and proceeds to talk in this British accent about how God is coming to rescue him. I felt like I was in a movie because I can't believe what was even happening. After he noticed I started shaking my leg, he then says, I guess we can proceed back to the car. We go back to his car and a miracle happens. My mother calls me. I was expecting her to scream at me, asking me where I was and to come home like she normally does, but this time she says in a calm voice, where are you? Now, she's Vietnamese, and in Vietnamese, I tell her that I'm out getting food with a coworker, and she says, okay, have fun, and hangs up. And again, in disbelief that she didn't care where I was at almost 3 a.m. for the first time, I lie and say, what? Oh, you want me to come home? Ah, uh, okay, I'll, I'll start heading home soon, and pretend to hang up the phone. I look at Mike and say, sorry, my mom wants me to go home now. He punches his wheel and sighs annoyingly loud, which gave me a jump scare for a moment, and he starts his car and just sits there in silence, annoyed, and kind of grinning the whole time. He eventually starts driving, pulls out his phone, and literally throws it at me. Open it, he says. Already exhausted and still not believing everything that was happening, my eyes grew fixated at over the hundred notes on his phone. What is this? I asked. He says it's songs and poems he's wrote. He looks at me and says, Go ahead. Pick one. I don't quite remember what the note said. The only keywords I saw were betrayal and woman and they stood out to me. And he says, Ah, that one. Would you like for me to sing it to you? I straight up said no and he continues to sing it for me and the worst part... He sings in this British accent. The whole drive was him singing in a British accent how God's plan is to stray him from the human race so he can overcome himself. I was zoned out the whole car trip. It all didn't feel real. My sense of danger gets lower due to how exhausted I was and how I was listening how this man wanted to eradicate the female species off the face of the earth, quote unquote, and how our quote, judgment day was coming. He drops me off on my street and even had the audacity to say, I had such a lovely time with you, darling. I slam his door shut and run down my street before he had a chance to start up his car. And after that incident, I ignored all of his messages, which he texted me two page long things of how he's sorry and how he believes God was here to put us together, and how my Asianness was the only thing holding him back from committing to real love with me. I stood in the back of my station to avoid talking to him. He would follow me back to my break room and thankfully my manager was there and yelled at him to buzz off before he called security. He later got the hint that I was not interested but continued to stare me down every second he had in the same station with me. Thankfully during that time I found a second job and my whole schedule was changed and I never had to see him at work again. I saw him at Target once but quickly ran back to my car before he had the chance to walk up to me, and I later found out that Mike was actually living with one of my lesbian co-workers, staying on his couch. I told her everything he said and did and she was completely shocked, and she'd never saw Mike like that. He was just very quiet and would crack a joke here and there. I advised her that she should keep a close eye on him, and she thanked me for relaying all that information and eventually 
he was forced to move out later due to whatever actions he did in those ensuing months. This happened back in November. I, a 20-year-old female, had gotten off of work and decided I wanted to see my sister and her kids. We sat in her bedroom and talked for a while. It started getting late and I live about 40 minutes away so I decided to head home. As soon as I got out of her bedroom I got a feeling that something was watching me. I'm not the type of person to get scared easily but by the time I got to her front door I didn't even want to go inside. I stood there for a minute and finally opened the door and ran to my car, immediately jumping in and locking my doors. I tried to convince myself that it was just the dark and I somehow spooked myself. I started driving and got about 10 minutes down the road. The whole time it felt like somebody else was still with me. My stomach was turning and I couldn't shake this feeling of being watched. I decided to pull over and text both my sisters, telling them where I was, what was going on, and how long I had until I made it home, then continued on with my drive. By the time I finally made it home, I was physically shaking. It felt like pure evil was surrounding me. I sat in my car, trying to work up the nerve to go inside. When I could finally open the door, I ran full speed down the driveway and all the way up the stairs, immediately locking the door behind me. It felt like something out of a horror movie. I went straight to the bathroom to splash water on my face to try to calm down. My dog started barking. I froze. He never barks unless something is there. He stopped barking after about 15 seconds. I wanted to go wake up my dad, but when the dog calmed down, I told myself that he had probably just seen an animal and everything was fine. I didn't want to bother my dad because he wakes up at 3am for work. I laid awake for hours trying to calm myself down. I woke up the next morning to a phone call from my dad telling me to pack a bag and to go stay at my brother's house for a few days. We have cameras and he said shortly after I had gotten home the night before, the cameras went off but he didn't check it because he figured that I was going down to my car to grab something really quickly. The camera footage showed a man lurking around my house and what's scarier is that he had stayed around until my dad got up to go to work, left, and when my dad left to work, he came back and just stood at the bottom of the stairs waiting. A neighbor happened to see him and the police were called. He ended up getting caught and went to jail but he just got out and I'm terrified and feel the constant need to look over my shoulder and make sure that he's not there. This took place in Maine a state in northeastern United States at around 2007 or 2008. I was in third or fourth grade and just for fun joined the local community service soccer teams with my friends from school. Usually one of the parents of the team would be the coach and another parent would act as assistant coach. But on this day, the assistant coach was sick so the community service center sent this other middle-aged to older woman to sub as our assistant coach. Well, this day happened to also be one of our teammates, I'll call her Mel's, birthday, and she was having a big sleepover party where the whole team was invited. It was all we were talking about during the game, and Mel was a really close friend of mine, and this would be the first time sleeping at her house, so I was really excited. We all were. During the game, as I was talking to Mel about the sleepover party later, that assistant coach woman I'd never met before called my name out and waved me over to her. I've always prided myself on having good intuition and this was one of those moments. For some reason I just got a real bad feeling in my stomach but I listened and went over to her. But as I stood about a foot away from her she wiggled her finger in a motion to get me to come closer and that's when my alarm bell started going off in my head more so I leaned in just ever so slightly closer because I was too uncomfortable to step forward. Once I leaned in a little bit, I think she noticed I didn't want to step closer, so she leaned in too and whispered to me, So, I'm Mel's mom. I'm going to be taking you to the sleepover party after the game, so come right with me to my car as soon as the game's over, okay? And I don't know why, but it just felt really off. I hadn't met Mel's mom before, 
and she was indeed supposed to be picking both me and Mel up to bring us back to the party after the game, but it just felt wrong. So I stuck to Mel's side like Velcro the rest of the game, and as soon as it was over, I told Mel that we should run to her mom's car and I'd explain. So we take off in a sprint and Mel leads me to her mom's car and we both hop in. But as her mom turns around, my eyes widen. I say, wait, are you Mel's mom? And she looked confused and says something along the lines of, yes, of course, why? And that's when my heart sunk. Mel's mom was not the assistant coach stand-in lady. And I told Mel's real mom what happened. And she was pretty concerned but never did anything about it that I know of. And I told my family the next day but only my grandmother believed me. So nothing ever got done to find this lady or figure out why the heck she was trying to impersonate my friend's mom to lure me to her vehicle. And I just thought I'd share because this situation really stuck with me. And I've always worried that maybe she tried again and succeeded with another child. I've since searched the internet for cases of children, particularly young girls around 3rd or 4th grade gone missing from school or community service events, and haven't found any that resonate with what happened to me, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. I don't even really know where to start to be honest. Me, uh... 28-year-old female and my brother, a 25-year-old male, have always been very close considering we're only three years apart in age and started hanging around with the same friend circle in our mid-teens. I had to move back in with my parents after a failed house share, it's a long story, and my brother has lived in the house down the road from my parents' home for about the past four years. He works from home but only part-time and hates his job. He came over about a month ago for coffee during his lunch break and I was off of work that day. So we're chatting and he told me about this girl that his friend had set him up with on a blind date and he was really excited. He went on the date about a fortnight ago and I heard all about it the next day. I'm going to call her Sarah. So he told me Sarah was gorgeous, a year older than him, tall and slim, long blonde hair and green eyes. He said she's probably one of the most beautiful women he's ever met. I was so happy for him because I don't think he's had a girlfriend since he was 18 and the way he was talking about this girl made her sound like they got on like a house on fire. He brought up that at the end of the date she did ask him if he'd like to meet her aunt and sisters because he'd mentioned he's unhappy with his work life and she said that her family owns a business and he could come around for a meeting the next evening. I thought that was kind of weird but he sounded really excited about it. I did make my feelings known, telling him that it sounded like a multi-level marketing scheme and that they were going to try to recruit him. He just laughed it off and said that he'd be going around to their house to discuss it and if it was a triangle scheme, he'd just nope right out of there. I said okay, be safe, have fun, call me if you need help or for me to pick you up, etc. So a few days pass and I sent him a text asking him how it went. He replied saying it definitely wasn't an MLM and there were more people there than just her sisters and aunt. He said that there were around 11 women there and that he was the only male. He got there and they made him tea and all the women were just chit-chatting until the aunt, a woman in her late 40s, comes out and shushes them all. They all take their seats including my brother who sits down next to Sarah and the aunt begins to speak. He says he wasn't really 100% sure in what she was talking about, but it sounds like she was reading gospel passages or something, bits of English and bits of another language unidentifiable by my brother. The aunt asked my brother to stand up beside her at the front of the living room and all the women started passing around a basket and filling it with cash. Apparently soon after this collection was finished, the women started singing in this other language and then dispersed around the house. He said from that moment onwards, it was just like a regular party and get together. He was a bit baffled but an hour later all the women had left and he was helping Sarah clean up glasses and plates when the aunt came over and sat down at the kitchen table. She handed my brother the basket of money, which he didn't take so I don't know how much these women had given, and said to him that if he comes back every week for the meetings, he'll receive the same 
if not more payment for his presence. He asked Sarah later that night once he left what the heck he just attended and she said it was a family tradition and as a man he should be rewarded and she was really adamant about him coming back the next week. He didn't go back and blocked her on everything. But what in God's name did my brother attend? Why were they just giving him money for just existing? Early tonight, I was on my way through Mississippi on Interstate 55. I pulled over at a rest stop I've been to a million times just outside of Memphis, Tennessee to pee, and I had something unusually scary happen. This is around 11.30ish, so the rest stop was mostly dead aside from truckers pulled into spots sleeping. I've stopped at this one before because it's pretty well lit and has security, which anyone familiar with Memphis knows is a blessing. Now I'm a pretty big guy, 6 foot 1, 180 pounds, yada yada yada, so I'm not usually intimidated by places like that, but tonight was different. I walk into the bathroom and things seem normal, but the handicap stall at the end was closed, which I didn't think much of at the time. However, after I walked up to the urinal, I started getting a weird feeling in my gut, kind of like when it's dark outside and you can't really decide if a tree is just a tree or something else, you know? I brushed it off and unzipped to get my business done so I can get back to the road. As I'm standing there, I hear shoes move. That sinking feeling turned into alarm bells almost immediately. I hear the stall door unlock and someone start running. Now this isn't a long bathroom, so I panic. I turn on my heel as I'm standing and book it for the door as I hear someone behind me running. I didn't stop or turn my head to look or anything. I just ran. I made it back to my car, but didn't see anyone come out of the bathroom while I cranked it, and I didn't hang around to see if anything else was going to happen. It may not sound like much, but this was one of the few times I actually felt some deep urge to just get out of there. I need to explain two things before I tell this story. First, I have a sleep disorder and I've had it my whole life. I sleepwalk, nothing too dramatic, mostly just do everyday things while sleeping, open the fridge, put clothes in the washer without starting it, take the vacuum out of the closet and set it in the middle of the room and leave, that sort of thing. When I was younger, this was an every night occurrence, but now in my late 30s, this is a once or twice a year thing. Second, I am native. I have a healthy respect for the stories of spirits my ancestors told. Many hunting trips I would sit around the fire with my dad listening to him tell stories of the tricks wendigos play to try to lure you to them. And while I'm unsure if I believe the stories of skinwalkers and wendigo, I don't tend to mess around. Just. In. Case. Shoot to roughly three weeks ago, my husband and I both work construction. We have hard, long, and rewarding days. Once dinner is over and planning for the next day is complete, the dogs have been taken out for the last time, our heads hit the pillows and it's lights out until the alarm sounds, and we sleep like the dead. I'm pretty sure a war could break out in our bedroom, thundering tanks and all, and we would sleep right through it, wondering in the morning where all the holes in the walls came from. Our bedroom is fairly good size and has a small bay window in the corner. My husband likes to sleep with fresh air, so... He takes the window side of the bed. This particular night, though, something woke me up, and I never wake up. The dogs were quiet, typical northwest weather, rain quietly tapping away, no thunder, no heavy winds. I looked the dark and quiet room over and nothing was out of place. The only noise besides the rain was my husband's box fan gently humming away. I was confused but decided to just adjust my blankets, flip my pillow, and go back to sleep. As I closed my eyes and took a deep breath to relax, I heard my husband, Babe, babe, come out here and give me a hand with the boys. Confused and still foggy from being woken up from a deep sleep a few seconds earlier, I opened my eyes to the pitch black of the room again. Rarely one of our three dogs will need to go out at night and if one goes, they all will go. 
We live in an incredibly rural area and it's easy for them to get lost in the dark woods. Not a good thing when you have bears, coyotes, cougars, and whatever else on our property. Babe! Babe! Can you come out here and help me with the boys? He called again. Voice right against the half-open window, not concerned, just demanding. Annoyed and groggy, I leaned up, propping myself up on a stiff pile of blankets to look at the window. It was too dark to see him. The floodlight is on the other side of the house. Babe! Come outside, my husband demanded. It was the third beckon that bothered me. He was never that pushy. If something was wrong, one of the dogs wandered off and he would say that. It's happened before where he would say something like, Come watch these two real quick, I can't find Murph. Or something like that. Something just wasn't right. I was finally regaining my focus and shaking off the sleepies, quite awake at this point, and I knew it was him. My husband had a very distinct voice. He's a Sicilian from Queens and has a very deep, unintentionally loud voice. It was at that moment, staring out the black window, I realized I wasn't leaning on a pile of blankets. The pile of blankets was breathing. I was leaning on my sleeping husband, listening to him call me from outside the window. Babe, come outside. The voice came again from the window. I put my hand down on my husband's face. He was there asleep next to me, but his voice, or what I thought was him, was at the window. I laid down next to him, very, very close to him, and closed my eyes very tight. In moments like these, I'm the type to just try and pretend it's not happening. I didn't hear it again and spent the next half of the night trying to fight off the spookies and had at some point finally fallen back asleep. I told my husband about it the next morning after his, oh my god, you look like death comment. I hadn't slept well. He laughed it off as I had probably had a creepy sleepwalking thing. The thing is, when I have a sleepwalking event, I remember nothing. I don't recall dreaming, walking, or anything from those nights no matter how hard I try. It's like a blackout. I am sure I was awake for this. Every time I think of it these past few weeks, I remember those hunting trips poking coals around in the fire with a stick while my dad tells his serious yet animated tales of wendigo tricks to get you to come with them. As silly as it sounds, I think there might be one in my woods. The story starts with me getting home from high school on the bus. I made it home and saw that my mom wasn't there and Since my dad was at work and my bro didn't get out of school until later, I was the only person there. I put my backpack down and go to untie my shoes and some dude walks out from a hallway. I go into Occam's razor mode and assume that this is some sort of handyman or repair guy since we had been moved in recently and had been getting a lot of repair work done to fix this terrible DIY electrical plumbing and paint jobs left behind by the previous owners. Additionally, he's wearing some sort of tool belt and fits the general repairman look. My mom's usually around when we have people working on the house, so I assume that my mom must have left not long ago and would be back soon. I nonchalantly tell the guy that my mom should be back soon, and he mumbles something like thanks and leaves out the front door to what I assume is his repair truck. At this point, I text my mom asking when she'll be back and who's the dude in the house. She asks if I'm joking, and it's only at that point that I come to and realize that I was sitting on the couch chatting with the dude who was burglarizing our home. At this point, the guy was long gone, and luckily my mom was only a couple of minutes away at a store just down the road. She gets back and we call the police, and they take a look around, but nothing actually went missing and nothing ever really came of it. I'm honestly glad it went down the way that it did since I only knew what happened and it was already over. This guy had put himself between me and the front door and I'm really not sure what freaked out fight or flight me would have done. I also can't imagine what the guy was thinking when I basically just let him walk out. (laughs) 
My fiance, a 27 year old male, and I, a 23 year old female, are soon to be married and are remodeling an old family home. We started working on the house about two or three months ago. My fiance bought a bunch of tools to use in the house to renovate. The house had been sitting with nobody in it for over a year. Keep in mind, the house is located in a fairly rural area. A few houses and trailers here and there, but not too much traffic. We have a rodent problem and have been setting traps to catch them. Three weeks ago, my fiancé went to check the traps and we had a rat that was alive. Long story short, he didn't want to take care of it, so he left it. I go off to work at 9pm and went over to the house to take care of the rat. It was raining and my mom and brother came with me. I went to the back door and it was wide open and water was blowing into the house. I was pretty angry. I thought my fiancé had left the door open. I shut it and finished my business there, and I asked my fiancé why he left the door open, and he claimed he didn't. I called nonsense on that and just left it at that. It didn't occur to me that somebody had possibly made a quick getaway. Fast forward to today, my fiancé and I went to our house to throw a whole bunch of trash and stuff into the dumpster we rented. When we went inside, we immediately noticed that some things were missing. Drills, sanders, etc. We realized that they had been stolen. We call my mother-in-law and tell her about it. She says make a police report. What scares me so much about this is that everything began to click with that rat trap incident. Somebody had been scoping us out. I would go to her house by myself on many occasions and always had the creeps and like I was feeling watched. My little brother even remarked that he felt watched there as well and asked if we were sure nobody was in there while we were gone. I noticed today when I was there alone that my dog was acting very nervous and suspicious. She wasn't running and playing games like she usually does and didn't want me to go to the backyard or the wooded area. I'm glad I trusted her and my gut feeling. I don't know if the thieves were there but I'm glad I didn't find out. We're currently in the process of installing cameras this had to have been somebody that lives near us and can monitor how often we are there. So to the person or people that broke into my unfinished home, let's never meet again. Update. So we did catch a car pulling in like it was scoping the place out. The people inside never got out, but they left. We asked a few of my fiancé's family members about it, and that was to our detriment. One of them went and spread the word that we have cameras and somebody in the neighborhood who owned the vehicle that we caught on camera slipped up and said that they already knew things had been stolen, which to me is basically a confession because we hadn't told anybody about the robbery until the incident with the car was caught on camera. So now more people than necessary know and we probably won't catch the person who does it. We still turn the footage into the police and maybe they can dig up some information. My husband, two children and myself lived in an apartment building last year. It wasn't an area of the city with a lot of drug users but we weren't bothered by them. They knew my husband owned a crossbow after an altercation with a druggie almost went south. A couple of them lived in my building, but again, they didn't bother with us. One night in late October, I had a really bad feeling. It wouldn't go away, despite me taking my usual measures to get out of this funk. Before falling asleep that night, my husband made a joke about it. I hope nobody's died. We laugh about it, but almost 98% of the time, my bad feelings are usually an indicator that someone either close in proximity or relationship has died. I felt it when my grandfather died, when my best friend died, and when my brother-in-law died. The feelings persist for a long time, and I was beginning to wonder if I was just yet another victim of seasonal affective disorder. It's a hot June morning when we notice the smell. The building manager looked for dead animals in or around the building but can't find any, and the smell just gets worse over time. One morning in August, shortly before my daughter's sixth birthday, the smell is unbearable. I was thinking about calling the building manager again when his jeep pulls into the parking lot, followed by a couple of police cars and an ambulance. My husband and I wait in the hallway, just watching as the building manager comes up to the second floor. 
He and the police officers open the door to the back hallway where there are two other apartments and the smell gets to be gut-wrenching. We go back inside and speculate about what's happened before I decide to go back out into the hallway. The cops are on their radios and heading down the stairs and I wave over to the building manager. What's going on? Ah, uh, well, one of the tenants of the building is dead. It looks like he's been there a while. My husband is in the doorway now and he and the building manager talk about how this particular man, a small Hispanic man named Elvis, had OD'd at some point. His sister finally decided to have a wellness check done on him since she hadn't heard from him in a while. And me being me, I asked, Was he decomposing? The building manager looked at me like he'd never properly seen me before. Yeah, there's what looks like grease on the floor. Oh, that's his adipose tissue. That's going to leave a stain on the floor. Yeah, we didn't interact with the building manager much after that, but my husband now takes my bad moods very seriously. And just thinking about that poor man, dead since October, lying in his apartment with no one around, it still haunts me. And that smell, I'll never forget what death smells like. I'm an 18 year old female and I went to the beach with friends and my boyfriend. It was a hot day so we had fun at the park and then in the evening went to Brighton Beach and took some pictures of the sunset. We were having a good time. My friends Jay, a 19 year old male, and E, an 18 year old female, and her boyfriend D, an 18 year old male, and my boyfriend, 19 year old. So we're all sitting there, me and my friends are wearing shorts because it was hot but the temperature was slowly going down. D leaves to catch a train. A drunk old man in his 60s approaches us. I could sense something was wrong so I asked him about himself and he sat down with us. He seems friendly and just looking for human interaction. I like helping people and talking to strangers. He seemed to take a liking to me but I didn't think much of it. Basically he told us about his messed up past, that his brother took his own life, his dad had prostate cancer and he got it too and only had about six months left. We were quite drunk so honestly we weren't all there. He told us about how in the morning he's going to jump off a cliff. Then he described his messed up life about self-harm, all sorts of terrible traumas. Obviously I didn't want him to off himself so I opened up about my past too. All the abuse that I went through as a child and it seemed to really help. He took my hand and started stroking it. I didn't mind because he was just looking for comfort. Anyway, we all talked for about 45 minutes. He's still holding my hand and stroking the top of it. My friend is telling him about her past too and that it gets better. He takes our hands, which is fine. He says that we are like his sisters, that he's homeless and he lives at the beach. He said he doesn't care about himself and only cares about other people. I asked, what makes you think you aren't worthy of being cared for? and he burst into tears and said, I don't know. I feel for him. I take on too many burdens from others because I want to help. Anyways, it's getting colder. I'm in shorts and a linen top because I gave my hoodie to E. I'm really good at dealing with cold. My body usually projects warmth. He touches my legs and says, Oh, you're boiling. Why are you so warm? Then touches my friend's legs and says she's freezing. We were still kind of drunk so I didn't really think anything of it. And before all this, he was talking about how he respects everyone, especially women and any men who are disrespectful to them that he'd deal with them. He told my boyfriend to take care of me. I ask if he likes jelly beans and then I give him a bag that I got from a store a few hours ago. My friend gave him a chocolate bar. We didn't really have any proper food. He looks at me and says, you're stunning. Absolutely stunning. And without sounding like I'm vain, I have thick, very long curly hair, dyed red, which does get lots of compliments, an hourglass figure and long legs and a pretty face. I'm not usually freaked out when a stranger calls me pretty, so it didn't really raise any red flags, and he calls my friend pretty too. Anyway, we give him offerings and decide it was time to go get some food, as it was about 8pm. 
Me and my boyfriend were about to go on a date and my other two friends went off to get some other food. So we get up and say our goodbyes. He places a kiss on my hand. He hugs each one of us a few times, but on the last hug, he kisses E's forehead and then hugged me and lingered a kiss on my jaw. He touched my back and says, Oh, you're like a furnace. It was over so quickly and slowly I didn't know what to do. At the time, we were all a bit like, God, what just happened? But that was yesterday and I talked to E about it and she says it made her so uncomfortable and me too. After we left him, we all agreed to meet today and give him more blankets and food, but we all talked about it and we figured that he was making some stuff up because it was so elaborate and practice and didn't end up happening. I talked to a friend who always hangs out on the beach and she said that she knows him and that he's a bit weird. Not dangerous, but definitely messed up. He tells everyone that he's going to take his own life and she's advised me to stay away. I went to the police station a few days ago to put down a complaint about some person who scammed me when I was trying to get a graphics card. A guy who seemed nice overheard the conversation and proposed to me to come over as he had spare electronic equipment that he didn't use anymore, saying that it could probably help someone else, he'd be glad to give it out. Now I didn't really put any hope into it, as it was unlikely that I'd find anything interesting, but I took up the offer. He didn't have that fishy person aura, so I accepted coming over in a few days. I wouldn't show up alone though, just in case. A few days after, I go to that house with my brother. First, the guy's not wearing a mask and tries to handshake me. There's this old person in the background watching us with a beer in hand, and I can see from here that the yard is a complete mess and there's things everywhere. He guides us inside, we take a look around, then he starts pulling stuff out of a bag and it's like 15 to 20 year old graphics cards that are completely worthless. So I told him it ain't gonna work, it's too old. He tells us to follow him to the garage which is even more of a mess than the yard. Things laying everywhere and there's a very dirty pool, not even covered although we were still in winter. He shows us one of those first generation graphics cards, old and bulky. I tell him that it's not gonna work either and he tells us to head to the shed behind the house with even more things. It's a shady place in a weird alley and I freaked out a little because the older person who hadn't said a single word was now just following us behind. He rumbles through his shed, telling me the card he intended to give me was somewhere but he just doesn't seem to find it. Too bad. I prepared to just leave but then he asked me if we could look at a PC that doesn't boot. I accept and go inside the room which is apparently the kids room and is as messy as every other room. I approach the computer and it's missing keys, it's kind of dirty everywhere. I sit down with my brother and we start fiddling with the computer. The grandpa appears out of nowhere and sits behind my brother which kind of freaks me out by the way that he just kind of stares at us. I'm trying to fix the PC and then this mother comes in and tells me she doesn't know much about computers and such but that she goes on the dark web. She asks me if I can check every device in the house to make sure that they haven't been pirated and that she's being spied on. At that point I just look at my brother, confused and we kind of mentally communicate, yeah, we need to start getting out of here, it's getting weird. I tell the guy that I can't fix it and that it's above what I know and he seems to be okay with that. The old man lights up a cigarette in the room and we just leave. The guy keeps us and talks for like five minutes and they seem like they wanted us to stay for dinner. We tell them we have a bus to catch and kind of walk quickly out of there. The mother stops us and asks if we're going to come back to inspect if their devices are pirated and I just say that we'll contact them again. I panicked and blocked that number when we finally got out of there. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, 
grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't forget to change your blinker fluid. <laughs>